I was just going to run through some context about what we'll be talking about today. So first of all, just what is a rezoning in general? What happened in East New York in 2016? And that's we'll pull some open data around that as well. And then what's going on at the new, first of all, what are the Nehemiah homes? And then what's happening there as a result? Of the and then we'll go into the panel discussion and hopefully we'll also have time for some audience questions as well. The rezoning. Rezonings are basically a main tool that cities use to direct investment into certain areas and away from certain areas. Um, it's also typically seen as the main tool that cities use to stimulate construction of housing. But what a rezoning is not, rezoning is not the city directly constructing housing. It's more of a framework in which the investment happens that tries to draw real estate investment into and away from it dramatically impacts property values. So it's basically the city going and saying, you know, you can build, uh, before you can only build a one-story home on this lot, now you can build a 30-story tower. And that means that basically before, there were there was not as much potential rent that can be extracted from that lot. Typically, historically, zoning has been, there are many types of rezoning, but the two types that have been used historically are upzoning, meaning you increase the limits, and that has historically happened to communities of color as a way of inducing gentrification and responding to gentrification. And then there's down zoning, which limits the construction and limits the, the amount that can be built on a plot. And that has historically happened in wealthier white communities as a way to preserve the character of the communities and also to inflate existing real estate values as well. So this happens in both directions, but that's the trends. So that's what rezoning is. What happened in East New York? East New York was the first major rezoning that de Blasio, the de Blasio administration pushed through as his way to respond to the housing crisis and really stimulate the construction of lots of new units. It was heavily contested by the community. Uh, that's a picture of a protest that happened at Highland Park at the time. And basically what happened was community members were concerned about gentrification and they were concerned about rising real estate values and profits. Uh, speculative investment that would lead to displacement of long-term community members and really destroy like the last real affordable working class black and brown community in Brooklyn. And so as a way to sweeten the deal a little bit, the de Blasio administration gave some concessions. One of those concessions was that he used mandatory inclusionary housing or MIH. And what that basically did was said to the property, said to developers, if you want to take advantage of this new rezoning, you have to build a certain percentage of your units as affordable. The actual percentage itself and what affordable actually means, it's complicated and maybe beyond the scope of this conversation, but basically what MIH does is it's an attempt to prevent rapid uh, displacement and real estate speculation, as a, but still, while still maintaining the idea of upzoning a community of color. So I really wanted to know what was this successful? What did this actually do? Now MIH, mandatory inclusionary housing, is a major part of most rezonings that are now passed in the city. And so now this is the first one that it was used in. So what has been the impact on it? And so the first thing you can do is really look at census data, which is pretty broad strokes, but it'll tell you a little bit of directionally what's happening um, between 2020, 2010 and 2020. We can see that both population and housing units are increasing pretty significantly by 10%. But despite that construction keeping pace with the, the population growth, we're still seeing the vacancy rate decreasing. Vacancy rate, a measure of how many properties are sitting empty at a given time. Typically, when you have a lower vacancy rate, that's when you have higher rents uh, because there's more competition for scarce units. So the housing crisis does seem to be getting worse in East New York, but I really wanted to know more specifically what is happening with MIH in particular. So what I did was I looked at, this is the, the green box, is where it was the part that was specifically zoned for MIH. And then what I did was I plotted out all of the new construction residential permits that have been approved since 2009 in this area. And basically, and then I bucketed them into like pre-rezoning, so like the six years before, and post rezoning, so the six years after. And what I wanted to know is for all the permits that were requested and approved, what percentage were approved after the rezoning? And so by comparing that within the green box and outside of the green box, that would give us a sense of how whether it impacted the rate of construction, the rate of permit approval, really. And if there was no effect of mandatory inclusionary housing, then you would expect those two comparisons to be roughly the same, but they weren't. Um, inside the MIH zone, 
it seems like there were more permits being requested after the rezoning relative to before. And so to me, that indicates that MIH is stimulating requests for new construction. And then when you overlay uh, density data on top of that, which is also con contained within the permit, you can see that the, after the rezoning in the MIH area, there are also more multifamily houses being constructed, so three plus units. So the permits were, there are more permits relatively, and they're also for denser housing relatively. But what about affordability? As I said, rents continue to increase throughout the borough, or throughout the borough, but also throughout this. This is really just showing American community survey data between 2015, the year before the rezoning, and 2019, the year after. Or, yeah, the most recent data for that this is available for. And you can really see that the rents are going up across the board. In some census tracts, as much as 50% increases. Um, but again, what I was interested in is like in this blunt box, which contains MIH, did the rents were the rents either the same, uh, higher, or lower? And I looked at that for census tracts that either inside of the box or adjacent, like touching the box. And what I found that the rents actually increase more in the areas that are adjacent to the MIH zone as opposed to the areas outside. So this is not, you know, this is descriptive data. This is not, I haven't pulled like statistically significant analysis yet, but it's directional. And what my takeaways are, again, is that MIH does seem to lead to more construction at a higher density, but it seems to fail to prevent meaningful rent increases and may have actually increased rents relative to the area. So that's all of the, that's what I'm going to talk about with the data right now. If anyone, I would love to talk more about it. If anyone has questions either during our question time or after, I would love to talk about it and develop this analysis further and potentially collaborate as well. So feel free to come find me after and talk to me if you have any more thoughts about this. But I also wanted to get into the qualitative data as well. What is happening to residents on the ground in the community? And so I wanted to explain very quickly the history of the Nehemiah homes. The Nehemiah homes were this it's a really large affordable housing development. It was developed by this group of churches called East Brooklyn Congregations in the early, when you think about what was happening in the early 80s, you had under the Nixon administration in the 70s, a real divestment from public housing in the United States and a real move away from the, the towers and gardens that characterize like NYCHA developments today and towards single family home ownership. And in particular, home ownership was seen as a way to mitigate displacement and say, we're going to give people a tangible stake in their community and give them an asset that will accrue in value. So this was like the major housing policy at the time. Also in the early 80s, the first kind of tract, this is a picture of it from above, was developed in Brownsville, Brooklyn. And this was a time when land values were extremely low in Brownsville. And the city actually owned a lot of vacant land. So what East Brooklyn congregations did was really remarkable. They basically negotiated all of these. They negotiated with the city and they negotiated with the state. And they, got, they were able to get free land from the city as well as forgivable loans. And they made truly affordable single family homes that were owned rather than it really as a little slice of the suburbs. You have like homes with uh, yards and parking pads and it's they're also built by the thousand so this first track contains 700 homes but they're actually still constructing the abaya homes today and there are i think almost 5,000 that are sorry 5,500 the abaya homes that are being one of you mind talking to you or another panelist anyways so yeah so this it's an amazing thing but what's happening with the abaya homes today <laughs> So today, this is how it relates back to the rezoning. Many areas within Nehemiah homes were originally zoned for a single family, which is what's constructed on the lots. But after the rezoning, many of them were actually rezoned. So what I'll show you is, what it basically looks like is, you know, currently they're single family attached homes, but you could build as high as like a six or seven story tower on those lots. So what happens when a developer sees that? Is they see land that's being underutilized. They see land that is not achieving its highest and best use. And when they look at this land, they're not looking at the Nehemiah home, but the physical structure that contains all of the memories and experiences that, of the people that live there, but they're seeing dollar signs, basically, of what the rents they can extract from that area. And so what we've seen is a wave of predatory buyouts where developers come and offer lump sums of cash that are not enough to buy a new home in Brooklyn today, but that is really changing the fabric of the entire community. And it's also, I would say, the, a major problem is that it's impacting the tax burden that residents face. So many people that choose to stay and want to live in Nehemiah long term, they're on fixed incomes, and they're not going to be able to afford these higher property tax assessment as the neighborhood gentrifies and changes. So this could really lead to a wave of 
gentrification and ultimately displacement. The second issue that I wanted to briefly cover is deterioration. So as a cost-cutting measure, Nehemiah homes were actually uh, not connected directly to the New York sewer lines, but they have a private sewer that is maintained by homeowners associations, which is, as we've talked about, I've talked about with them before, this, they're not a municipality. <laughs> it's, it's a big responsibility to maintain sewer lines privately. And what gives a lot of uh, the new developers that are purchasing plots are no longer buying into that communal, the communal maintenance of sewers, despite being contractually obligated to do that. And then you think about climate change as well. This is one major storm away from not being able to, to maintain sewers anymore. So this is a real problem. And then really the third thing is just the neighborhood character as a whole. As I said, I, we've talked about this. We've seen it as like a link in this broken chain of promises to black and brown people in the United States. And this is the latest. It's like people were promised a home and a stable place to live. And this is the promise is being undermined by the pressures of the market right now and by this upzoning that we were just talking about. And so with that, I really did want to move into the panel. I'm hoping that you'll She's an attorney for Assemblymember Walker, and she is really knowledgeable about this as well. So she may be coming through in the next minute. But until then, we have Ida Matilda and Carmen. And so I'd love to kind of just open up the discussion by asking, first of all, again, thank you so much for joining. Can you tell me a little bit about like how, like when did you come to East Brooklyn in the first place? And also, what was your experience of moving into a Nehemiah home? Can you tell us a little bit about that? I'm going to say that my name is Matilda Dyer, and I live in Brownsville, which is that all of these, as we stayed in here, they extended. They built juniors, they built the next block, and the next one, and the next one. And that was a total change in the community. I mean, it was exciting to come home. Everybody was at the front planting their flowers, real community living. When I moved in here, um, we got to know each other. I became a member of the association, which even as he shared earlier on, it's, it was a good thing because it made me know who's my neighbor and we looked out for each other. But at the same time, even you know, 30 years, 35 years after, it has placed a heavy burden on those of us who are on the, on the board and are struggling to get people to join the board because nobody wants to take the time. I got up retired. I retired two years ago. Most, most of my time is spent my neighbor, my partner, my sister right here. We spent it going to the city, going to attorneys, going here, trying to fight the developers or not just fight them, but what they're doing today is pulling down the homes that are at the end. They are purchasing these homes, they are pulling it down, and they're building these tall structures. So it's a big change, but we are in a fight. We are in a fight for our community. We're concerned about the sewer line, the long-term effect on our neighborhood. We're concerned about them coming in and disconnecting or overburdening the sewer line. We are concerned that they are not uh, becoming a part of what the neighborhood has been. So I'm so glad to be here today to share with others what we are going through in Brownsville. And not that we do not understand that people need a home that's understood, but do not come and destroy what has been built, where has been us a community of neighborhood. So that's where. <laughs> I mean, and, and your story is very moving, I think, for us poor New Yorkers here. Like, we, we see the city change, and it's always a trade off. Of, you know, we have housing crisis, we need more housing. But, you know, I grew up in Chelsea where it was only porn stores and, and empty lots, and now there's huge buildings that are ugly. But I also respect that we need more housing. So, do you see, I heard a lot of negatives, so rents are going up. And, but have you done analysis of how they? You know, compared to other parts of the city, number one. And the second one, you mentioned it's a big building, it's going to damage the community. But do you see a scenario where, like, those buildings or more density can exist and continue harnessing community, building community? What I see is them coming in and not really building community because they are not taking the empty lots, which is okay. They were empty, but they are homes where people are and they're offering up the homeowners because, again, for various reasons, they are selling because the taxes have increased. They are most of our homeowners are senior citizens, retired, and are having challenges also. 
So what I see them coming in is not just providing rules, it's pulling down what has already been established. And I do not see it happening all over Brooklyn. Certainly there are certain neighborhoods happening in, but in our neighborhood, it affects us. So that's my concern. You're coming in, you don't want to be a part of what's happening in here. So you're destroying what has already been established. And that's one of my concerns also. Housing versus no housing, the Hindi versus Hindi debate sort of comes in another question that's always there. Sort of a presents a color. Either upzone communities of color, or there's no housing. And I think you have to look at it in a historical context of which communities are bearing the burden of real estate speculation. Right. Um, which communities, frankly, uh, do we need to achieve reparations for? Because when you look at the history of real estate, it's intricately bound up in race. There's, it's very, ex very explicit throughout the 20th century. And so the question I think really becomes is like, how do we actually use rezoning is a tool for reparations and can can it be used as that when it's intricately tied to the marketplace which again is, is rooted in racism and yeah that's another question and just a response but um, yeah thank you so much for that. my name is Corin Daniels so see there and come on I was waiting for you oh, okay. <laughs> sorry Okay. My apologies. Glad you're here. <laughs> I am in the third phase of the Nehemiah, we call it the Nehemiah project. My name is Carmen Daniels, and I am a retired assistant principal with New York City. Yeah, thank you. Don't know why that is, you all went to school, right? <laughs> but um, I could not afford a traditional home on the New York City pay when I started. So I looked left, looked right, and I remember telling the, the attorney I, I signed up for a home, put in the papers, and when the attorney sent me the papers, I said, I called him up. I couldn't sleep the night after I read through the thing, and I called him up the next day. I said, sir, you made a mistake. He said, what do you mean? I said, this thing is selling me. I have a million or more, how many million dollars to pay? I can't pay that kind of money. And he said, listen, that is what you would pay with 30 years of mortgage. I said, change it, I don't want it. And so Nehemiah came in and I was able to afford a decent home that I could pay my mortgage and could do all of the things I wanted to do to get the American dream that we were promised when we came here. I, as you can guess, I came from another country. I'm from Diana, South America. Okay, so all of that led me to living from 1998 in this home that was like a dream come true. And then suddenly we started to see the changes, changes. Some of the parts that we have, that the buildings are going on, we asked the city to allow us to build community buildings there, community centers to have post offices and things like that, because we don't have any, we have to go either to another area in Canarsie or in, where's that, East Brownsville or somewhere else. They said no, because it's too close to the subway. There are no buildings. Now, if you come along my, just the head of my street, the entire area is all these high rises. The first thing that upset me is the disrespect, because there was no consultation with us about the zone, the rezoning, which could not have been done before for us to get those buildings there. And we would not have had high rises. It would have been regular buildings, just like our homes. Secondly, you the taxes, I'm on the tax uh, committee with the whole system. I've gone to meetings with the commissioner, with whoever. Oh, we pay more tax than even the mayor. The mayor has a two, two homes for how many millions? Our homes right now are valued like maybe about 500,000. The 
depending on how long you were there. The mayor pays more, less tax than we do. So all of these things, I've joined the, the board just to make sure the education system also is a different issue, is a mess. But it seems to me that when we are black and brown, we face another issue in all ways. And so that is one of the reasons that both of us and Edith, we are here, we join the, the association just to make sure that we can equalize things a bit. And I have to thank you for the work that you have. Yes. Yes. So thank you. He did a lot of research and brought to our attention a lot of things that we were aware of, but made it quite clear for us. So we certainly appreciate him and his group as they've Sure. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, I'm here tonight, Assembly Woman uh, Latrice Walker, because she came down with a laryngitis, I think, a lot. I'm honored to be here in a place. I've been doing, I'm an attorney. I've been doing housing work for over a decade. But my housing work focused in the area of when the Great Recession happened, foreclosure defense and trying to keep families in their homes, working families. Soon enough, it became very clear, it wasn't long, that the most at risk were African-American and Hispanic families, which I like to, when I talk, just put that all under a banner. I know we, we use black and brown, but historically, I like to keep it under the black banner because in terms of the history of home ownership, in America, it's people of African descent who were systemically denied. And then when, through the work I do, I've learned that, especially post-World War II in the North and the Northeast, African-American families who came from South, down South with the Great Migration, worked hard and saved their pennies and bought their homes. Even when they were redlined in places like Philadelphia, New York, et cetera, and then those very same redlining maps were used to target them for subprime lending. So fast forward about two years ago, the Assemblywoman and then uh, Council Member Lika Avery Samuel asked me to look at Nehemiah with them. And I was just very, okay, this is not my bailiwick. You're not necessarily in foreclosure. And but all these developments, I was not a zoning lawyer. For years, friends of mine and colleagues would say, you have to look at zoning if you care about racism and housing. And it's, I'm like, no, I don't have to look at zoning. It's so complicated. The little nuances, you know, go talk to a land use lawyer. I don't want to look at zoning. And, um, and fortunately, in thinking about how I could come up with the learning curve on this and provide service to them, because the need is, it's, it's in your face. If you drive through Brownsville, East New York right now, you don't really have to look hard to see the impact of a very callous, cavalier, inconsiderate resorting mm -hmm. with complete disregard for the nature, character, and context, which is a term used in zoning, disregard for that community. And the fact that Nehemiah might be, we still have to double check, might be the first African-American home ownership dedicated coming out of Jim Crow, coming out of everything else. It's in the city, but dedicated home ownership development for a black, for a black community, black and brown. So again, a lot of it too, well, I've learned this, for us as a family and for all of us in here on black and brown, because it's people from Puerto Rico, it's people from Central America, all of these people were excluded from home ownership. And as working families in a metropolitan area like New York City, as you described, the access and entry into home ownership was provided by that sort of subsidy. But let's not forget that everyone got subsidy. When the settlers came, they got subsidy. To buy the first land. When the post-World War II, everybody got subsidy. 
So fast forward, I reached out to the new school, Jonathan, it's okay. And then I started to learn about zoning. So let's talk about zoning. I just know zoning from the periphery. But the impact of zoning, we talk about racial covenants that excluded people of color. We talk about redlining that excluded people of African descent all across America. Restrictive covenants, specific exclusion by the federal government even when developers wanting to give, to sell homes in Levittown to African-Americans, they couldn't. So zoning takes on a different character because it doesn't appear on its face to be exclusive. It's development. Mm -hmm. So there's this whole discussion about nippy yippy, you part of that. Not in my backyard, yes in my backyard. So when you object to zoning, it seems like you're objecting to moving forward as a society, that that's the position they're in. Yep. They, they're saying, we are now seeing the context of our community, correct me if I'm wrong, just jump in, changing because you rezoned. And now they're viewed as trying to live in an old world and not be attending to the needs of the city for more housing. Not, but what has it done? What it's done is not just change the context of their neighborhood, it's changed their values. They're now being preyed upon regularly by developers who want their lots because every lot now is, it was a two story. They can go up six and eventually somebody's gonna, somebody's gonna give in. So it's creating this harmony in the community. There are people who have passed on, whose children we may not understand these dynamics. The buyers that are coming are cash buyers. So if even she wanted to sell her home and maybe give another family an opportunity to come in to start over who's a civil servant family, that market is now changed dynamically. And the prices of rentals and the people who now rent, I tell people gentrification is not about not wanting wealthy people, or forgive me for saying it's always a very uncomfortable term when we use these racial terms in America, but not wanting white people. But it's about how do you make sure that society or there are places where working families live? Not everybody's making up hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Where young families can live, where people can start out if they want to be a poet or they want to be a nurse's aide or they want to be a where can they start out in the city and be part of a community? And this so we're fighting to I got fought on, but <laughs> I know you have some specific I also want to make sure we have a little bit of time for audience questions. Yeah. I, had, I, had a, I had a few questions that I'll try to combine it. Sure. It's, it's, sure. It's, 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 we see the city when during these processes of rezoning. They have community input, supposedly. Uh, right? We saw that happening even with this East New York rezoning, with some of the um, concessions that they gave. MIH and the school, et cetera. What sort of community engagement do you think is necessary? Do you think that there's a way to be more responsive? Well, clearly there's a way to be more responsive to the needs of the community, but what do you see as some of the ways to, to sort of respond to the needs on the ground when you think about just policies? And also, is rezoning even the right tool to be thinking about when we think about building more housing or stimulating the growth of housing? How can we do it in a way that is not preying upon already marginalized communities, uh, especially communities of color. So I guess, I know it's two questions in one, but I don't know, you can think about are there ways in which like, you think that, that rezonings or these policies in general could be better responsive to your needs? Do you want to answer? Want me to answer? You want to start first? You should jump in the conversation as well. Oh, me? <laughs> um, I was going to say that if we are going to restore First of all, we, the, the, the community needs to be involved. There should be upfront this question as to what you're going to put here. Because I remember when, as Matilda was saying, 
There was a time when people said to me, you're going to go live there, they're going to kill you. That's what my family thought. And I had to do a lot of praying because you saw this, this place that was deserted, devastated, and all of that. The fact that we came in and were willing to put ourselves on the line. My question to the city is always, why is it that when we build up, you then come in and you want to change the dynamics and change the entire outlook that we've had? And, and the first thing that I learned the other day, it made tears come to my eyes. I'm listening to the city discussing that they thought that our homes would not last more than 30 years. 30 years. Yeah. And so that they didn't already hear that I am there now 23 years next to me, this me. And they're there for much longer because we're in the third phase. And then there's a fourth phase. And we have built up the entire area of East New York. And we have no say in anything that is being done is okay, you don't exist. And as that is one of the changes I would like to see first. Hey, they weren't built to last. They were intentionally built with shiny materials. Mm -hmm. So the intention, again, was not to create the American dream, but to create a sort of home ownership public housing model. Mm -hmm. So when these people pass on, of course, they're second owners, the city could take it back and do what it was. But we also learned that they said, it's not even on the table about preserving it. Don't talk to us about that. Mm -hmm. So well, go ahead, sorry. It's, no, I was just going to say one of the things you come into home ownership and we told ourselves that we were going to do so. We knew we had to do some upgrading with our homes, which we did. And now to be told that you know, it's not there to last and yeah. it's on the wayside. After building up the neighborhood, you now are coming in to try to, to take over in a sense. Uh, all right. So in the city charter, there's a movement in the city right now coming out of all the super side rezoning that you guys have been reading about that happened during the Blasio administration. And even when he rezoned for mandatory inclusionary housing, I don't know if you guys touched on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And mandatory inclusionary housing has a component of spot zoning. So I could just buy a lot in the middle of a block mm -hmm. and just say I'm going up now four stories and I'm making 20% affordable and the affordable brackets look like high end anyway. And I get to go up in terms of what can be done over time as you guys get older <laughs> and you start paying more taxes and you become part of the city and you start becoming more active. We have to change this charter so that the community board or the community voice is dispositive, as we would say in the law, as to whether this community would be resolved. It's ridiculous that it's only advisory. So you could quarrel as much as you want. So that's one. Two, I think there needs to be disincentives to rezoning or, or manage rezoning so that communities, every community that's rezoned, I believe in and tell me if that's your experience or for your knowledge. The community now has turned itself into an attractive asset community. Fixed up your homes. And people just don't go like want to resolve the dumpster pit mm -hmm. sitting with all the toxic waste. No. So everything you did turned that neighborhood around. But the people who were there who did that thing that makes the that, that creates the capital, the rezone development, they don't benefit, they don't, part, they don't profit. So I think if you built into the system, not just restricting, but repatriating again, or, 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 or sharing, because what necessarily happens is with these rezonings, these developments that get really huge tax breaks, or the rezoning itself has a value, right? So. If I'm sitting on this lot here and now it's rezoned so I can go here, 
that's a huge economic value mm-hmm. that not only she doesn't want to go up, so she can't get that value, mm-hmm. but it adversely impacts her value if she wants to stay. So there needs to be something built into the law to, to address that disparity or that disparate impact on the rezoning. And now the city is talking about looking at racial impact, community impact. Again, it could be racial impact, but you even take an artist community that's so on her own. We need that as a city. The question is, how do we make sure that impact stops the development? Or if it doesn't, how do we preserve that alongside the development? So these are all troubling questions. To me, there should be a hold on all rezonings right now, all developments right now, because what they've done is priced everybody out of the city. Everybody, no matter what your ethnicity is. You can't really, it's the only people making a lot of money are the developers. And that's, I think that's exactly one of my takeaways from the East Side, which is that the it's taking one thing into account, potential rents. It's not taking into account the community, the actual social infrastructure, the bonds that have been created within the community itself, the organizations like the homeowners association themselves, um, or what they've done to literally invest in their properties and in their communities. And so it's a very, I really appreciate all the specifics of suggestions that you just gave for how we can improve design situations. Uh, we have about four minutes left. Uh, um, yeah, so I really appreciate hearing these stories. I think it provides such important context to this issue. And I think especially the consideration that it, it really seems like this rezoning was a case of developers really saying we can profit off of this neighborhood, so we're going to kind of make the city do this, and we have like the power and leverage to make this happen. And that you would ignore that process and thinking about you talked about how the population was growing in this neighborhood and that there's now so it's healthy you talk about moving into your home with your kids and wanting to be able to sustain a community where maybe like your children can have their own home later but still stay in the community and support a growing population i wonder if you have any ideas for like a better way to approach this so that you would be able to meet the housing needs of a growing population in your community but not not have it not have your voices be ignored and, and kind of just like pushed to the side in the way that they were you want me to help you with that that's it <laughs> see that's a little bit of a I, that's a great question right but it has it's a double it's just, Sword or knife and carrot or whatever you'll call it. Because most types of rezoning does not attend to, in our experience, the growing needs for housing in that community. Rezoning is done to fill the need that maybe the city decided it wanted to attract yuppies and puppies and people coming. <laughs> young people. And so it decides to rezone your neighborhood to house these new people. So it's a hard question for the answer because it's, it's really not about that community's needs or Williamsburg's community's needs in Williamsburg. The Hispanic population was wiped out. 40% is a huge number. Mm-hmm. And some of them were homeowners. They, and then they had tenants who were families or extended families. So it's really... Um, The burden is not on the existing. This is part of the problem. The existing people are not given a part of the conversation. Their prices and value of community changes drastically before they rise. And the housing that's developed is not even available to their children or their neighbors or people within their socioeconomic strata. Because every rezoning development optics 
even at the low income level. MIH is just a farce <laughs> because low income includes working family and it's now 65%, 125%. Yeah. 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 So they're moving in. And they're going to the country on the weekends. In a working class, what we used to call a blue collar neighborhood, where people had barbecues on the backyard every strap drive because they don't have a country house. So that's the problem. Yeah, I, mean, I, I know that you made the comment that like maybe zoning isn't even like the right kind of avenue to be talking about. Eating, you know, I really appreciate that. Right. 